Thank you. The uh, title of my talk is Jump at the Knee, Current mm -hmm. Concepts and Treatment. I'm from Adelaide in Australia. Um, for people who don't know where Adelaide is, it's on the southern Australia. There is Sydney and there is Melbourne, which are the most popular cities. Adelaide's famous for its beaches. Unfortunately, it's also famous for its sharks. And it's famous for its wine growing areas. And if you have a good wine from Australia, it's likely to come from the region where I live. Um, it's also very famous for Australian football, which is otherwise known as footy. It's important to tell people about footy. Um, it's only played by people in southern Australia and it's often confused with rugby. It's a mass participation sport. In my town, 10,000 people play Australian football. And, um, hopefully video will work. and this is a video of Australian football. It's our national game. It has its most corporate support. It's played on a very large field, that's a 50 metre mark where he's kicking the ball from. Um, there's 18 players per side. The athletes run a very long distance, um, up to 12 to 13 kilometres in the one match, but it's a short burst like uh, world football. The object is by hand or by foot, is to kick the ball down to the, uh, to the goals. Um, unlike American football, it's a collision contact sport, but uh, we don't wear any padding, so we don't have any padding. <laughs> we play in our underwear, I just <laughs> <laughs> um, The object of the game is to kick the ball through the, through the goals, and it's one of the only games in the world where if you actually miss, you can still score. So those two big posts are where you kick the ball through, but if you miss, you get less points. Um, there's a high injury count in Australian football, and uh, hence there's a lot of, uh, it, usually there's soft tissue injuries. Um, thankfully, there's very few spinal or head injuries. And again, it's unlike American football. And the object is to kick the ball through those goals to score six points. About 300,000 people a week go and watch Australian football. So, moving on to jumper's knee, um, we should call it a patella tendon because it's not a ligament. The injury is known as patella tendinopathy. It used to be called tendinitis, but there's no inflammatory cells. Tendinosis refers to the pathology. You can have tendinosis of the tendon, but still not have tendinopathy. The sports affected are jumping sports, track and field, basketball, volleyball, football to a lesser extent. Young athletes can be affected. And you must remember in the young that it can be an apophysitis at the distal patella called Sinding Larsen Johansson disease. The epidemiology, overuse is a significant component of the injury, especially jumping. Males are more than females in the clinical studies, but there's no evidence that this is actually a risk factor. Patella malalignment and impingement have been um, uh, talked about in the literature, but there's no convincing evidence for these. Again, flexibility, lack of or enhanced flexibility has been talked about, but there's no evidence for that either. Making the diagnosis, it's made by history of anterior knee pain aggravated by exercise. Usually it's an insidious onset where the athlete can describe some increased load. It's painful at rest. Examination is usually accompanied by some tenderness of the distal pole of the patella, but it must be remembered that asymptomatic athletes can be tender as well. Imaging, it's easily seen by ultrasound and MRI, but though the diagnosis is clinical, images can be normal. There's no correlation between the changes found on ultrasound and MRI with symptoms. And in some respects, it's like osteoarthritis, where the more changes you have, the more likely you are to have symptoms, but it doesn't always correlate. Post-operatively, images do not correlate with outcome, and people are using <coughs> Doppler ultrasounds. And that's a typical a picture of, a, of a, a swollen tendon on ultrasound and again another one on MRI with it, it, the injury. What is the pathophysiology? It's thought to be tender tendon overload with micro trauma resulting in failure of the collagen cross linkages of the tendon and that exceeds its regenerative capacity because of low metabolic rate. The tendinosis, especially in the posterior fibres of the tendon, but it's not known why the posterior fibres are more effective. Mm -hmm. 
the normal, normal collagen creep is 2% and strain arises when, it stra when it's stretched by 2 to 4%. In normal tendons, collagen is 70%, type 1 collagen is 70%, but it's known in injured tendons and in old tendons we have more type 3 collagen. So the pathology, when you look at it, is loss of the tightly bundled collagen fibres, increased ground substance, disorganisation, fibrosis and neovascularisation. The cells that are predominant are fibroblasts, not inflammatory cells. But one must say that at the molecular level, more research is needed. And where does the pain come from? If we could really solve this issue, we could probably target better and more effective treatments. And the bio biochemical irritant pain model of Karam Khan is still probably the one in vogue for the onset of the pain. What are the treatments? Well, there's multiple treatments. In sports medicine, this usually means they either all work or it means none of them work. And the literature on patella tendinopathy has, a, has focused on surgical outcomes. <coughs> the non-surgical management is considered the best initial treatment option. We try to correct training errors. We try to increase flexibility on the, on the guys that a more flexible muscle is able to absorb more energy, but there's poor evidence for this. We look at gait and biomechanical errors, but we're unsure about which ones. But we look at relative rest, so unload the tendon. Complete immobilization is bad, but it's difficult to strike a balance with the athlete and the coach with the prospect of tendon healing, as all team physicians and physiotherapists would attest to. So rehabilitation, a lot of these are taken into account. Strength, flexibility, motor patterns, usually it's done closed chain. We try to look at some proprioception, some endurance, and a gradual progression of load. The exact recipe, though, is quite elusive, and there's no evidence to support any one specific exercise protocol. People talk about eccentric therapy exercise. We'll talk about that in a second. What about non-steroidal anti-inflammatories? They have an analgesic effect, but not always, they don't always work. And it's probably best avoided if the plan is to unload the tendon. But there is some recent evidence that say the inflammatory in process might actually be important in healing the tendon, although it's not a part of the pathology of the tendon. What about corticosteroid injections, commonly used? There's numerous studies, though most of them are of poor design. Again, there's good pain relief, but not always. And Smith's uh, uh, protocol on the Lancet, where he compared to physio and wait and see, he showed similar result, better results with the corticosteroid at six weeks, similar results at 12 weeks, but worse than the other two groups at one year. And it should be said that rupture as a consequence of a corticosteroid injection is an antidotal complication. It hasn't really been uh, reported in the literature except on one occasion as far as I'm aware. The corticosteroid is negative on collagen synthesis so it's said not to put it in the tendon but positive on the connective tissue and adhesions between the tendon and the tendinous, peritendinous tissue and it, I think it works as a membrane stabiliser and hence has, is good for, for pain relief. There's few side effects but there's low efficacy at 12 weeks and it's probably best avoided, but is often used as, again, the team physicians will tell you, close to important competitions. What about the local physiotherapy modalities? So we'll go through some of the others that are now used in patella tendinopathy. Electrotherapy, ultrasound and laser have some theoretical pop positive influences on collagen synthesis. Sorry about that, but their clinical results are unproven. Eccentric exercise. Eccentric exercise is loading the tendon muscle unit during muscle lengthening that generates a higher force and concentric contraction. So I think the easiest way to look at eccentric exercise is when you are running, you are trying to slow down your femur and that's when your hamstring acts eccentrically. So as it lengthens, it's generating more force. It's used in mid-substance Achilles tendinopathy with good outcome results that approach 80%. And on a, on a biochemical analysis, it increases metabolic activity and the formation of type 1 collagen. And it's always been scared to put people through eccentric exercises because we've always used pain as a guide to our rehabilitation protocols. 
in eccentric exercises, we do not use pain as a guide. <coughs> and the most commonly one used in Australia would be a decline squat. Um, but as I said, it's unsure which eccentric protocol is most effective. It's uncertain how effective they actually are, and all in all, it's quite confusing. There's a new trend to do heavy, slow resistance training, where it says that there's some tendon remodelling and may be helpful to the posterior fibres, but there's no studies on this. My viewpoint on this centric exercise is that uh, if you start doing the exercise, unless you do enough, it's inadequate to cause any, any improvement. Then there's a therapeutic window where it may improve, and then if you do too much, like the athlete then continues, it aggravates the underlying tendinopathy. And I think that's a good diagram for a mid-substance Achilles tendinopathy. I think that one is a good diagram for patella tendinopathy, is sometimes there's very limited or no therapeutic window where the eccentric exercise will reliably work. And so hence there's lots of different treatments for it. So what are the principles of rehabilitation? And this is from Jill Cook's work, who's from Melbourne. She would state that you try and increase musculotendinous function with a centric and plyometric exercise, increase shock absorber, absorbing capacity, retrain the motor patterns, maintain the fitness, and look at flexibility. But I thought her last point was very important, that you need to counsel the athletes that they may be in re rehabilitation for as long as six months, so it's not un or even longer. So it's not unlike an ACL reconstruction that we heard about this morning. What about some of the other treatments like ESWT, extracorporeal shockwave therapy, where radial shockwaves are generated ballistically and, and applied to the area of maximum tenderness. We know this from urethral um, surgery with urologists, and the objective is to stimulate tissue regeneration. And that is a typical unit that produces ESWT. Now, if you look at a review by Van Leeuwen in the BJSM in 2009, he reviewed seven articles which showed 298 <coughs> tendons, of which 204 had ESWT. The treatment results were positive, but the met there was significant methodological deficiencies in the papers. And this is very typical of any tendinopathy studies. Platelet enriched plasma or growth factors have been used since 1987 and with widespread media attention, now particularly Europe, United States and recently Australia, there's recent use in musculoskeletal medicine. And PRP involves injection of platelets above the normal concentration that is found in usual blood. And that is a PRP preparation, so you draw the blood out, spin it and you, you take out the platelets in various different methods and guises. And a, a study that was published on patella tendinopathy was showed that 20 male athletes with at least two years of, uh, 18 months of symptoms were pro prospectively evaluated for six months. They didn't show any significant side effects and statistically improved. But when you really look at the study that has been analysed, the quality of the study was given a three out of 10. And the subsequent study was given four out of 10. So in effect, we're revisiting some of our surgical studies, which I'll talk about in a minute. Final point is PRP is not regulated as a therapeutic substance in many countries, if any, and therefore it's got a widespread use. We're allowing the use before we have done the basic science. What about sclerosing agents like polydocanol? It's been injected into the neovascularization under ultrasound control. And that's the neovascularization from a Doppler ultrasound that you would see. And the idea is to inject these sclerosing agents in and around the, ne around the, um, the neovascularization to disrupt the blood vessel and the nerve supply that accompanies the blood vessels. And it's very good for pain relief and allows athletes to go back to sport early, but whether it helps the healing is still not known at this stage. Because of some of the side effects of the sclerosing agents, People have used high volume image guided injections of saline, particularly in, in Great Britain. And they inject 40 to 60 mils into the side of maximal, maximal vascularization to disrupt, disrupt the nerve vessels and nerve supply. It is very, uh, uh, it is uh, very uh, sort of sexy and, and, and 
very good for the clinician because often the athlete gets back at two weeks so they think you are doing a really good job but we're not sure whether the, any of this changes the healing. In Australia, again, there's a, there's a polypill where they use ibuprofen and doxycycline. Doxycycline is an anti-TNF uh, factor, and that's thought to be important in tendinopathies. Um, again, there's no evidence of using, uh, using the polypill, but uh, there is widespread use in some parts of Australia. Uh, <coughs> GTN patches, and Justin in the audience here, will um, he's certainly done some of the research on that. Again, good pain relief but not much evidence for long-term efficacy. Finally, we'll end up on the surgical procedures, and it's sort of recommended that you have six months of conservative treatment before surgery. The results suggest that 80% success rate in the literature. Unfortunately, there's many different surgical procedures and no randomised controlled trials for any surgical procedure. And one study that appeared in the British Journal of Sports Medicine showed the poorer the assessed quality of the study, the better the surgical results of patellar tendinopathy. And there's multiple different procedures undertaken, an open tenotomy, patellar tenotomy, drilling the patella, realignment, longitudinal tenotomy, mini incisions are making a big uh, play in places like Scandinavia. So in the conclusion slides is that tendinopathies, especially insertional tendinopathies, are very a difficult problem to treat as we do not know much about the pathogenesis of this common sports medicine condition. And in fact, patellar tendinopathy is one of the most difficult of the sports-induced insertional tendinopathies. And I'd like to take this opportunity, it's been a great opportunity to see Doha, the, where the yesterday was very similar to Adelaide in the summer, and I'd like to thank the Aspatar organisers for supporting me in coming and seeing the, this uh, really fantastic facility and thank the ESACOS organisers for inviting me. Thank you very much.